purpose of this short talk is to highlight in brief the 10 key steps to performing an ankle arthroscopy successfully. It should be watched in conjunction with reading the orthorical surgical technique. The complete detail that you need is on the orthorical platform and this talk is based on the information there. As always, rely on the manufacturer's technical advice on how to use their instruments and devices. And there are a few ways of performing arthroscopy. This is simply a description of what works for me. First and foremost, the cases where ankle arthroscopy is a useful intervention are not infinite. Intra-articular soft tissue pathologies from any cause do respond well. Arthrofibrosis or synovitis following trauma, or less commonly due to an inflammatory joint condition, are probably one of the commonest indications for ankle arthroscopy. MRIs are often normal, but as long as there's an appropriate history and localising symptoms, there's likely to be treatable intraarticular pathology. Debridement of the osteoarthritic joint can also be a useful intervention. Surgeons' appetite for this varies, and there is some controversy more generally about the use of arthroscopy for some degenerate joints, especially the knee. My own experience, however, of arthroscopy in the ankle is that for the majority of appropriately selected cases, it's a highly useful intervention. There are no absolutes in terms of deciding what arthritic case will do well, but essentially these need to be at the milder end of the spectrum, which means pain after increasing levels of activity and really minimal pain at night or at rest. Patients should always be counseled that there's a chance of significant and immediate severe and permanent exacerbation of the underlying arthritic process following a debridement. If a patient's going to have a debridement, they should be counseled also for further and more significant surgery, either a fusion or ankle replacement. This is never an immediate requirement, but may be needed within four to six months if the intervention is not successful. Patients who have very clear anterior impingement as part of arthritis also benefit from debridement of the anterior joint space. Anterior ankle impingement per se, though, is not hugely common. The condition is also known as footballer's ankle and refers to pain occurring at the anterior joint line when the ankle is dorsiflexed, such as walking up a hill or running. There may be quite a marked chylus visible on the x-ray, but the absence of one does not exclude this as a pathology, and the main pathology can be synovitic rather than a bone spur, removing the impinging tissue where the bone or soft tissue tends to solve the problem. A scope also has a major role to play in the initial management of most symptomatic osteochondral defects with debridement and microfracture. Loose bodies are sometimes associated with OCDs, but can occur post-traumatically or with other injuries or without trauma in conditions like synovial chondromatosis, and an ankle arthroscopy is key in managing these. Another condition, sometimes coexisting with a Taylor OCD, is ankle instability, which is either mechanical or functional. The unstable ankle usually has a degree of pain outside these episodes of instability, and it's often due to synovitis or fibrosis that should be dealt with at the time of primary surgery by a separate therapeutic intervention. It's also key to know the type of case not to start with when learning ankle arthroscopy. And these are anything that can make access to or visualisation of the joint more difficult. A large anterior spur will make access more difficult until you're experienced in its easy removal. It's also worth knowing young active men can have surprisingly tight and unyielding ankles to arthroscope so these shouldn't really be your first cases. More problematic for those starting out are cases where the entire joint can be filled with dense fibrous scar tissue that makes any joint space difficult to identify initially. This occurs in post-fracture cases, cases of previous joint infection or previous open surgeries. There may actually be very little joint space at all, meaning you can only insufflate with a few mils of saline rather than the normal 20, and no joint surface at all may be visible with the first pass of the scope. You'll need to progressively carve out a space with aggressive soft tissue shaver as you go in these sorts of cases. And to do that well requires experience. Clinical assessment of the ankle is very much tailored to what the underlying condition is or is thought to be. Patients tend to localize ankle pain well to the anterior joint line, which is 
an easily pubble location. In the presence of either an edematous or highly inflamed ankle, the actual joint line though can be difficult to detect, as it also can be in the presence of significant anterior joint spurring. The easiest way to identify the anterior joint line is to locate tibialis anterior, just go medial to it, where it will be possible to identify the distal tibial plafond. It will not move, whereas the talus beneath it does move if the ankle is passively plantar flexed and dorsiflexed. Examination is easiest carried out by having the ankle dependent with a rolled up towel or pillow behind the calf, which also allows the ankle with gravity to fall into plantar flexion, which further helps open the anterior aspect of the joint. Most ankle pain is felt anteriorly or anterolaterally, where the joint line is palpable. In the context of persistent ankle pain under consideration for arthroscopy, which has occurred after an ankle sprain, it is also worth asking direct questions whether there's any posterior ankle pain. The mechanism of an ankle sprain is not simply inversion, it's inversion and plantar flexion, and a proportion of patients with pain will be getting symptoms due to posterior ankle impingement. If this is not specifically asked about, it will not necessarily be volunteered and pain here cannot be dealt with by an anterior ankle arthroscopy. It's a question worth asking all patients with chronic pain after a sprain. One must know also how to isolate the talus and immobilise it during examination to look for subtalar inversion and eversion. The subtalar joint is very close anatomically and can be an alternate source of symptoms that needs to be identified and requires a different approach arthroscopically. The differentiation of ankle from subtalar pain may also require cross-sectional imaging and potentially a diagnostic injection including the use of a radio-opaque contrast medium.